So we are now, we are staying within cascade flows and experimental stuff, but we are moving now a little bit to, to the west, to Cologne, the other Cologne. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Advin Munoz Lopez. Uh, Edwin, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, Marius, for that introduction. Um, welcome everybody to my presentation. My name is Edwin. I've been working at the DLR in Cologne for three years now, and I will be presenting today the progress on my thesis titled Experimental Numerical Investigations of SBLI and Flow Control on a Transonic Compressor Cascade. So getting right into the presentation for today's uh, presentation, I prepared the following agenda. I'll start by talking about the unsteady SBLI, more or less a focus on the context of compressor cascades. I will then talk about the transonic cascade Timero, which is a design that I optimize as a baseline for my thesis. I will then talk about the experimental methods and the main measurements that we obtained with this baseline so far. And then I will focus a little bit more on the optimization of flow control methods that we've done on this uh, cascade in order to improve the unsteady SBLI behavior. Before going, of course, into conclusions and perspectives. So uh, let's start with the unsteady SBLI. And I can show you very quickly what I'm talking about within the context of compressor cascades uh, with one of our videos of one of our tests within our wind tunnel. And in this, uh, this is the baseline cascade that I just mentioned. But the only thing that is important to know at this moment is that it's operating at choked operating conditions. And um, what this means is that it, it allows us to obtain this very nice regular periodic shock structure as you're able to see. But nevertheless, uh, I would describe the shock within the passage and the flow within the passage to be naturally and highly unsteady. And of course, it goes without saying, you don't want to see this in your engines. It's going to uh, in, uh, it decrease the performance. It's going to decrease reliability of the performance, but also of the uh, components over uh, long exposure. And uh, this is something that we want to address then. And this is really ubiquitous to so sonic flows because you normally have a geometry that you want to interact with the flow. And this geometry is going to bring two complex properties, which is a boundary layer and a shock structure. And the interaction between these two very complex properties is in itself very complex. So there's a, a wide variety of reasons and mechanisms why this might be occurring. Um, so this is not a unique observation of our wind tunnel or of our configuration also. We've been studying uh, SBLI's unsteady SBLI behavior since more or less the 1940s. And uh, there was a, an observation cycle up until around the 1990s where we were just mostly observing it and trying to learn how to measure it. And then we slowly went into a cycle of explanation where we actually tried to put a reason to try to understand the, me the mechanisms behind these sort of uh, oscillations that we saw. Um, I, what I want to mention is that we've seen uh, from all of the literature, which of course is not extensive in this slide, um, we've seen this occur in um, numerical studies, we've seen this in experimental studies, we've seen, in, seen this in fundamental geometries, um, complex geometries. And uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of different reasons why this might be happening. So this slowly brings me to uh, the previous work at the DLR before I arrived, uh, where they're focusing a bit more within the application of compressor cascades. And they've done a lot of experimental studies there uh, with high PFE, very advanced uh, measurement techniques to try to get to the bottom of uh, why it, this sort of thing happens also in compressor cascades. Uh, they have also proposed themselves a theory uh, very recently as to why this a mechanism that might be uh, responsible for this sort of oscillation. Which brings me then to our current work within the TMR Consortium, um, current work at the DLR, where we've really focused my thesis around two overarching questions. The first one is, what are the physical mechanisms driving the unsteady SBLI behavior in uh, compressor cascades? And the second one uh, being, is there any way to optimize flow control methods in order to mitigate these effects, but at the same time, in order to improve the performance for a wide variety of operating points, so for a working range. And I will disappoint you right away, and I will tell you that I do not have definitive answers to these questions just yet, but my job today will be to convince you that we're in a really good position to uh, address these questions in the following months. So why don't we get right into it then? Um, I would say that these questions, then we, we separated them into uh, objective uh, packages of objectives. The first one related to the baseline design. So I optimized the design. I validated its working range. I characterized its oscillating shock behavior. 
And what we are working right now at the moment is to compare this very high quality experimental data with also a high fidelity CFD results to try to gather new information uh, of the oscillation that we are observing in both cases. Then the second package of uh, objectives relates to the optimization of flow control methods. So we are working right now also on the optimization of different flow control methods, different configurations that we hope uh, as well to validate uh, in order to see whether we, we actually see this improvement of performance in the experiments. So uh, this brings me then to the first package I related to the transonic cascade Timerum, the baseline uh, design. Um, and all of the results are explained in detail in a publication. We formalized it into a publication titled The New Chapter of Transonic Compressor Cascade Design at the DLR. Uh, I, I, I jotted here down the content, but I can give you a couple of slides about the main results. But of course, if you want the details, uh, I would refer everybody to the publication. And uh, this publication really relates uh, or talks about how we went about to the optimization of this baseline uh, design. That uh, we use a multi-objective optimization process in order to minimize the losses at the design point and over the working range. And then we pick the final design based on off-design post-optimization of design analysis of the best members. We arrived to this uh, geometry that we see on the screen uh, with an aerodynamic design point of um, um, an aerodynamic in, in inflow uh, velocity of Mach 1, 1.2, and AVDR 1.05, which describes the loading on the cascade due to the presence of the sidewall binder layer, an inflow angle of about 145.7 degrees, and Reynolds about 1.3 million. Another, we handle a number of different off design points, but the one that is going to be most relevant for today's presentation is one in the same um, speed line, but with a different, uh, much higher inflow angle. So, in terms of the experimental methods and measurements, uh, a lot of the work that we've done is mostly thanks to the facilities that we have available at the DLR in Cologne, uh, namely the Transonic Cascade Wind Tunnel. This is a very unique facility. It's a continuous loop uh, wind tunnel that we're able to operate up to a Mach number of 1.4. Uh, very wide range of Reynolds numbers as well, uh, as we've been able to confirm recently, and very low turbulence intensity. But really the most unique features about this wind tunnel is all of the different items that we were able to adjust during the operation of the uh, of the test in order to obtain the operating point of the cascade that we're looking for. So we're able, for example, to change the height of the lower end wall. We also count with uh, suction devices for the upper lower end walls, but also uh, in order to um, also on the side walls of the cascade itself inside the passages. And the whole thing is set up on this rotating frame that we it's able to uh, we were able to rate, rotate in order to help us achieve the uh, inflow angle that we're looking for. If we take a closer look at the test section, uh, it looks more or less like this with the TCTA mounted on it. Uh, first of all, in, uh, here in this picture, we're able to see the pressure taps that we set up at the inlet of the cascade, uh, also in the uh, along the suction surface and pressure surface of the middle passage. Uh, we see also the suction slots that I was mentioning for in order to control the, the size of the sidewall boundary layer. We see the slotted tailboards that we're able to control in order to change the outlet pressure being applied to the cascade. And the outlet probe as well that we're able to operate uh, in order to measure the, the wake of the uh, of the design. And this linear cascade setup also uh, allows us very good uh, optical accessibility. Uh, as you're able to see in this uh, PAV setup, which is probably one of the most complicated ones that we've uh, done with the in order to measure. Here we're measuring uh, simultaneously uh, high speech layer end and uh, high-speed PIV, uh, high-speed layer, and of course, with a wider field of, of view to follow the, the shock movement, and the high-speed PIV focusing very closely to uh, on the suction side of the of the blade. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we'll show some results, uh, maybe not all of it that we have. The, the first package of results has been formalized in a publication titled The Current Gap Between Design Optimization and Experiments for Transonic Compressor Cascades. Uh, again, I jotted down here the content, but I can show you very quickly the main results that we obtained from it. Uh, and it really deals all about the validation of the working range uh, of the cascade as we optimized it. And we obtained, uh, you see on the black line, the um, working range according to the total pressure loss polar. Going from the left, at uh, short conditions all the way up to stall, where you have more losses, of course, as you go increase the inflow angle. And you're able to see here the different points that come from the different experiments. Uh, the points, the labels are the number, the test number. And we're able to see that throughout this uh, very uh, extensive working range, 
we're meeting with reasonable agreement, three to 6%, the values that we have predicted uh, from the optimization itself. Um, this is, there's also different AVDRs in this graph, but I would refer to the publication for those details. Um, however, when we started looking into the details of the wake, for example, we see that the, the wake has, um, the CFD starts lacking a little bit on the details. For example, in the loss distribution, we see higher peaks uh, than what we measure in experiments. And we see as uh, a narrower wake, uh, which is uh, very reminiscent of the presentation this morning from our colleagues at the uh, University of Florence. Um, yes, yeah, so we talked a little, a little bit about it in the presentation and we attribute it as well to uh, a lack of modeling of the diffusion uh, within the wake. Um, another package then of uh, experiments and measurements that we perform and we formalize uh, is within this uh, publication title, Investigations of the Unsteady Shock Bandolier Interaction in Ultrasonic Compressor Cascade. Uh, one more time, uh, if you want the details, go to the publication. I'll show you very quickly the main results. So we obtained that uh, we, we wanted to do this high speech layering of multiple passages to see how they interact with each other. So this is the, the field of view basically of our camera uh, for these uh, measurements. We apply a flat field correction to these images and we interrogate these uh, zones in the passage where we look um, and apply an algorithm to try to obtain the main position of the shock. Um, and then uh, this is done for them for the entire recording. And we average the main position of the shock as we, as we, as we see it here within this 10 millimeter window from the top of the window. Um, and then, so that's basically what we call uh, where our signal of the shock position comes from for every uh, instant. Uh, of course, from there, then we were able to obtain the spectra for the different passages, um, which I'm gonna bring them all up here. The different lines come from the different positions of the outlet probe for any given, for every measurement. They're not relevant, like we were, what we were able to see is that um, regardless of the position of the probe, the shock was moving very similarly in terms of its spectra. Um, and the main result really was that we saw the topology of the movement of the shock is, has a low broadband frequency around 500 to 550 Hertz and a very specific high frequency tone at 1,140 Hertz. And this uh, high frequency tone seems to be uh, it's, it's a tone that we've seen also in previous uh, experiments. Um, so there's has to be some sort of relation there between them. And um, and the publication itself, uh, so this is just what I, what I just mentioned. And in the publication itself, I also compare how passages two and three, they interact with each other. And passage four is a bit more noisy and it seems to be moving out of phase sometimes with the other passages, but it provides a very, very good, um, very interesting uh, comparison of what is going on within the cascade. Um, this slowly, slowly brings me then to a new publication that we are planning uh, that I'm, unfortunately I'm not gonna be able to show a lot of results uh, from because we haven't published it yet. Uh, we plan to call it the Unsteady SB line of compressor cascade. Uh, my part will be part three, mechanisms of shock oscillation. These are the main fields of the different uh, PAV uh, measurements that we, we took. Uh, here, this is actually a superposition of different measurement campaigns. We see the 2D, 2C, two component PAV over the for a while, field of view. Uh, and here it's also superimposed uh, a smaller region of high resolution PAV at 20 Hertz. And also uh, two different regions. There's a third region near the trailing edge as well that I'm not showing here of uh, where we measure the high speed PAV um, um, of the cascade, of the flow in the cascade. And this is more or less what it looks like under the shock. And this is exactly the type of data that we're uh, currently working on post-processing and trying to formalize in order to present in the publication. Uh, this is especially challenging and it's been uh, taking a long time because we're trying to do it simultaneously uh, to compare it with some uh, LES results that we obtain as we work in close cooperation with a numerical department at the DLR. And um, these are the results that we obtain from the LES. I can say, uh, not sure a lot of results yet, but I can say that we met um, a frequency of 600 Hertz. So that compares really well with a frequency of 500 to 550 from the experiments. And uh, we actually see a larger oscillation of the shock in this case, uh, but we have a number of theories why that might be occurring in the LES compared to experiments. Perfect. So that's slowly 
really brings me and gives me enough time to talk in detail about the optimization of flow control methods, because this is really everything that we've studied so far. It really it gives us input to what we were trying to do to try to uh, reduce the um, steadiness of the shock. And also, uh, I would say that everything that I, I optimized for the baseline cascade, we were using like very conventional uh, programs that have been in our department for a long time. But everything in this process chain, I had to like um, develop from the ground up, starting with uh, the parameterization of the different flow control methods using um, modifying the control points of a baseline surface in order to study different flow control methods. It's a program that we call VortexGen. I integrated it with a Centaur. This is a commercial measure in order to measure it in with a 3D unstructured mesh, of course, to get all the details uh, of the very, this very tiny flow control methods that we wanted to study on the blade. Uh, we have a, a, a chain of urine simulations uh, where we're trying to model the shock oscillation and then uh, optimize it. Uh, I will just mention very here very quickly that we're using the K omega SST model, gamma re theta uh, transition. Um, for more of the details, you can refer to the previous publications. And uh, of course, we have a, a post-processing uh, routine that feeds to our optimizer, AutoOpti. This is a very well-established optimizer from our department. And the main objectives of our, um, this optimization is going to be to minimize the shock oscillations and the losses of the cascade at the same time. So that we're trying to reduce the shock oscillation, but also improve the performance of the cascade um, in general. So I'm going to talk in a bit more detail for each one of these, uh, starting with the uh, Vortex Gen. So at Vortex Gen, I, I implemented the roughness patch. It's very simple, very, um, you just essentially have the lengths and you have the position and the kind of roughness height, the equivalent roughness height, uh, KS. I'm also implemented a dome. Uh, everything, all of these shapes can also be negative height. So it can also be a dimple. Um, I also implemented a ramp. Uh, which can also turn into a wedge or a plow if you have the negative height. You And the most complicated uh, shape, perhaps, with about 12 design parameters, is a shock control bump as per our Ogawa 2008, which can, we can also use as a plow uh, if we want to. Um, then moving on then to the meshing, I won't spend too much time here. Uh, I basically integrated the output of Vortex Gen uh, into the mesher in order to refine the regions. So this is a test case with a lot of different uh, flow control methods placed on the, on the surface of the blade. I integrated them, so I'm refining exactly where I need to. So here you can see, for example, our refined dome with a refined uh, wake region uh, behind this um, a flow control method. And then we move on then to the actual um, URN simulations that we do for, do for this in order to measure the performance of this given flow control method. I thought the easiest way to show you is uh, from the residuals themselves. I tried to simulate first RANs and then converging ERANs to uh, the point where I want to uh, in Lemoc number 1.2 that I mentioned previously um, for the cascade. And then I apply here after the convergence um, a signal uh, applied on the inlet flow angle that has a very uh, specific shape. It's basically been taken from the PSD of the experiments. I've created a synthetic signal with all of the frequencies that will give us a shock oscillation then within the urine simulation with the same PSD uh, as the experiments. Uh, this is, I should say, uh, because in the urines, we're not able to capture uh, unsteady SBLI as for I just showed, for example, in the LES. So uh, this brings me then to the post-processing and uh, I'm able to probe the a 3D region uh, above the plate and measure the position of the shock at any point. And it looks more or less like this in um, over a period of time. Uh, here, then I'm able to get the position of the shock at every point and do a lot of different statistic measurements on it. Um, yeah, so that's basically most of the post-processing that I do for this optimization. And it brings me then to the strategy that we're using then for this optimization from this data. I'm able to calculate, for example, the standard deviation of the shock uh, over time. And uh, basically, because as I mentioned, we want to make sure that whatever we're optimizing is, doesn't work just for one operating point, but it, for a working range, then in this case, I'm uh, averaging this uh, standard deviation with the standard deviation of the of design point as well. So basically, I'm doing 
two um, chains of CFD simulations to obtain um, my first objective. I just want to note here that an average of standard deviations would be an average of the variances. And the second objective is, as I mentioned, uh, over this time, we also captured the average total pressure loss. And we do this then for each operating point, and we average that again. And that is uh, my second objective for this optimization. So uh, unfortunately, um, okay, before that, uh, the optimization region itself. So here I'm working at the moment with a 20% essentially span compared to the, the cord length region, uh, periodic conditions uh, on each uh, wall on each side. And within this region, I've let the optimizer uh, basically place flow control methods um, in order to determine what the best position would be and what uh, the, the best design parameters would be in order to reduce, uh, minimize the objectives that I showed. Uh, so slowly that brings me then to uh, some of the preliminary results. I don't have the results yet for all the flow control methods that we want to study. I'm doing for the uh, for now individual flow control methods and trying to optimize them and see what kind of uh, results I obtain. So this is for the roughness patch. And you can see here the baseline that we started with. And as we uh, I, rem I remind you, first objective, we're trying to minimize the shock oscillation. Second objective, we're trying to minimize the, the cascade losses you're able to see that I've been able to find uh, throughout this optimization. The, these are different members and the green ones are the Pareto front, of course. So I've been able to find members that improve both the oscillation of the shock, uh, but also the losses uh, produced by the cascade. And so this was a very interesting result that, that we are obtaining from, from this optimization result so far. The best members I can see have um, a roughness height, a kind of roughness height of 40 to 50. Uh, micrometers, uh, which is very much on par with uh, some of the experiments that we had done in TFAS, for example, that is so like, this seems to be like the region where uh, you would be able to trip the boundary layer, but not cause additional losses than what you need, basically in order to uh, make sure that the shock sees an incoming turbulent boundary layer. The, um, and then as I mentioned, reducing the shock oscillations can also give you an improvement of the shock after losses. What does this actually look like? And I will take a couple of seconds in order to explain this uh, video. Uh, here you can see the uh, inlet flow angle vectors. So basically the, in, the flow angle that I'm imposing at the inlet of the domain. And you're gonna see here in the red boxes are the roughness patches. And you can ignore this one for now. Uh, it's turned off. It's not, I'm not optimizing that one. I'm optimizing this one. In the contour, of course, of the mug and on the blade, I have I have it colored by this shear stress ball. So you can see here that there's very low shear stress. And then uh, after the, the patch, there's a little shear stress, and then the, the, the boundary layer is turbulent. And um, so in this case, for this member, it has been optimized to a thin roughness patch, just uh, good enough to trip the boundary layer. And of course, uh, I'm not able to <laughs> show a lot of videos, but you have to believe me that in the oscillation of the shock here is a lot less than what we've seen from the base layer. So this is the sort of things that uh, I've been playing around with for some time. And uh, that I hope to do exactly just like that, but with all the different complicated shapes that, that you saw. So that brings me slowly to the end of my presentation uh, with some conclusions and perspectives. So I would say in terms of conclusions that uh, we've been able to successfully design a baseline cascade that is operating a high loading and um, in highly transmitted conditions with low losses. And we've validated its working range performance. Uh, we've characterized the SBLI behavior in the passages of this cascade with an, identifying a dominant low frequency band uh, with this persistent high frequency tone. We've described interactions between the passages and we've obtained a number of very high quality uh, experimental and numerical data that we hope uh, will give us new insight for future publications and uh, for my thesis, of course. I have all also been able to build a suite of tools to optimize flow control methods for compressor cascades, uh, but I think like it could be easily extended into different applications. Uh, we've implemented so far roughness patches, vortex generators, bombs, uh, and plows, uh, and some optimization preliminary results of the roughness patch optimization uh, shows us that we are able to reduce the shock oscillations and improve the losses at the same time. In terms of perspectives uh, for our future optimized design, I think we're going to have a lot of uh, different possibilities to find the best configuration possible to manufacture and to validate. 
and the time frame allows allows us allows us to do this. And there's going to be extensive data data available for the baseline from the baseline design to for comparison. And the experimental numerical work is going to I think is going to provide us very unique insight into all of this. And for future research projects, I think uh, there's going to be a very solid basis available that can be adapted and extended. And new possibilities to the com uh, study more complex phenomena, more complex geometries. And finally, a lot of high quality data that will be, I think, can be used for validation for years ago. That brings me to the end. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them now.